Good evening. Welcome to Pennsylvania Inside Out. In his new book about slave neighborhoods in the Old South, author and historian Tony Kate uses the pension files of former soldiers in the Union Army to tell the stories of men and women marrying across plantation lines, striving to get right with God, and creating cohesive neighborhoods, providing us with a view of slavery that most of us could not have imagined. He is an assistant professor of American history at Penn State, and his book, Joining Places, Slave Neighborhoods in the Old South, is published by the University of North Carolina Press. Thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be here. Reviewers of your book say that it's the most exciting book on the subject in 30 years. How is it different from other uh, books on the topic of Amer American slavery? Well, we've been studying slavery for about 30 years, and we've learned a lot. We know a lot about slave families. We know that slaves practice Christianity. We know that they had a very uh, sort of brilliant didactic culture of stories and songs. What we hadn't known was that there was this very powerful sense of place that slaves had. And in the area that I studied, uh, they talked about it in terms of neighborhood. And uh, the book is really an attempt to look at this sense of place, how slave society felt to people on the ground, and what are the implications of uh, a slave society that is divided along neighborhood lines. Now, your book, your book focuses on the Natchez District in Mississippi. Tell us a little bit about uh, Mississippi, which didn't join the Union until 1817. Um, what was going on in Mississippi at the time? Well, we think about Mississippi as uh, one historian once described it as the most southern place on earth, but it's actually a new part of the South. So uh, it's really an example of the way in which the Cotton Kingdom really kind of moved west over the course of the early decades of the United States. And so uh, Mississippi is a place where very large plantations prevail, very wealthy slave holders. It's a place where uh, slaves actually outnumber white people by as much as two to one, which is actually the reverse of most of the South, where uh, slaves are just 30 uh, percent of the entire uh, population of the South. So this is really the most kind of princely domain of the Cotton Kingdom. When the South wants to find a president, they appoint Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis is from this area. He lives in Warren County, which is kind of the northernmost uh, county of the area that I write about. And and they do that because they're acknowledging his place in uh, American politics, but they're also trying to acknowledge the place of the West and Mississippi in the Cotton Kingdom, which is really, uh, until 1850, the most productive uh, area of cotton cultivation. Now, you paint a picture of slavery that I think sort of uh, flies in the face of what we've been hearing for a number of years. Number one, you talk about relationships between plantations, uh, slaves who, who literally make paths from one plantation to an adjoining plantation um, and, and court and marry. Um, you also talk about independent production and, and other things that are, are so different. Tell, tell us a little bit about how you gleaned this new information and, and its importance. Uh, a lot of it is about looking at relationships that, that scholars have been studying for a little while. So we've known actually for a while that slaves work a lot obviously for their owners, but they also work a lot for themselves. And so what I was trying to do is to look at these kinds of relationships like marriage, like independent production, and see what they look like, how they look different on this neighborhood terrain. And so what you find is that when uh, slaves are looking for spouses, uh, they look in the area of their neighborhood. They look on adjoining plantations. And so uh, kinship really becomes the sort of strongest ligature, the strongest link in slave society. It's the strongest link between these plantations. And what you also find is that there's actually a whole kind of range of intimate relations that slaves are engaged in. We've known for a long time about slave marriage, but slaves also uh, engage in relationships like cohabitation, which is they could distinguish from marriage. They also take up. They also sweetheart. And so what you find is a whole variety of relationships between men and women and the way in which those relationships are uh, explained to people, that they're kind of held out as norms, that uh, the bond between husband and wife is exalted. All of that is done on neighborhood grounds. It's done by neighbors. And so it's one of the most important things that a neighborhood can do for any particular person or any particular couple is help 
help them keep their marriage together, uh, which is under the constant threat of slaveholders who are buying and selling people at will. Did slaveholders turn a blind eye to these courtships, the sweethearting that was going on? Uh, there are some relationships that they know worse, that they know better than others. So they know a lot about marriage because one of the things that distinguishes a marriage from anything else is a wedding ceremony. And so slaves understand that the main threat to their relationship is the owner. And so what they do is something very interesting, which is they try to draw their owner into the relationship. The significance of a wedding is that you have this big formal ceremony where owners have to lend their imprimatur to owners to, to uh, a, a marriage, but also that other slaves have to lend their imprimatur and have to see their owners doing it. Sweethearting they actually know less about. Uh, it's very odd that the uh, confirmation that I find for sweethearting in contemporary records is actually in uh, investigations of slave conspiracies. And you see it in the record where uh, the planter who's taking down the testimony of an accused rebel actually uh, underlines or, uh, or puts sweethearting in qu quotation marks, probably because he'd never heard the phrase before. Uh, and so it's very odd that this very intimate relation is kind of revealed under these very exacting proceedings. Of. Well, these neighborhoods really were very important in terms of communicating and building a resistance. Yes, and so if you're a slave and you decide that you need to get away, that uh, you've been whipped by an owner or you're afraid of getting whipped by an owner, you're going to run away. Where you're going to lay out is probably on a neighboring plantation, on an adjoining plantation, because that's where you know that you can get safe harbor, that's where you know that people will not reveal you, that's where you know that you can get food and shelter. If you leave your neighborhood and try to uh, lay out in another neighborhood, you might actually get help, but you might not because it's very risky to harbor runaways and people aren't willing to run those risks for everybody. Now, you're the first person to use information gleaned from pension files, former uh, the pension file testimonies of former Union soldiers um, who provided really a, a rich trevor, treasure trove of information about what was going on. First of all, what is a pension file? Uh, during the Civil War, uh, the United States Congress makes a series of provisions for pensions for former soldiers and their families. And they don't make any distinction in the availability of those pension files uh, for black people. Uh, it's often, people are just beginning to realize how important black soldiers were in the Civil War. About 190,000 of them served, and about 100 and 20,000 of them served from uh, slave states. So when the Union Army invaded the South after 1863, people go to Union lines and they join the Union Army. And so what this generates after the war is a great deal of testimony about people's intimate relations. So if, for example, you are uh, a, a woman, a, a former slave who was married to a soldier, your husband dies, you're actually eligible for his pension. But uh, so you go to the pension uh, bureau to apply for a pension, uh, and then they ask you, well, you say you were married to this soldier. What do you mean by married? Or you say you were his husband. What do you mean by husband? And then people begin, have to begin to explaining what their intimate relations were like. Of course, people are trying to make a case so that they, they get money, and we're not talking about a little bit of money. We're talking about, uh, in, in our terms, significant amounts. Yeah, so the kind of conventional amount of money that is at stake for a widow, they're trying to get $12 a month, which sounds like next to nothing to us. But if you think that the, about this area where the average agriculture wage for an agricultural laborer, which is what these people would be doing, is about $12 a month. So basically, it's uh, a living. And so people will do a lot to uh, get a living. And some of what they'll do is to make up stories. So there are cases of people who are applying uh, for the pensions of men they never knew. Uh, what you get much more often is people who are trying very hard to shoehorn very complicated lives into the tidy ca bureaucratic categories of a pension file. And so as a historian, what you have to do is you have to look at these records and try to figure out when people are hewing their own stories to the contours of the pensions category, pension uh, bureau's categories and when they're actually telling you what their lives were really like.
You're watching Pennsylvania Inside Out on WPSU. I'm Patty Satalia. Our guest tonight is Tony Kay. He's an assistant professor of American history at Penn State and author of Joining Places, Slave Neighborhoods in the Old South. His book talks about the relationship slaves formed across plantation lines and prevents or presents a view of slavery that is very different from what most people imagined. Uh, one of the people you talk about in your book is, is Marianne Hellam, who has one of these complicated relationships. Uh, she's a afraid of putting this money at risk and she only tells part of the story but how uh, did you as a researcher know you know what what material you could trust and what you couldn't trust uh, basically it's it's reading and rereading the records it's uh, and it's comparing one record with another and so uh, what happens with Marianne Hellam is like a lot of people she is born in the upper south so the people in the area that I study most closely in southwest Mississippi virtually all of them are people who uh, came from the upper south uh, in the domestic slave trade and she's one of those people uh, she's applying for the pension of a man named William Madison, who is her last husband, but she's not the only husband she had. And so when she tells her story, uh, she wants to give a kind of simple story to the pension record, pension uh, bureau. And so she tells only about William Madison, and she says that all five of her children were uh, children she had with William Madison. It turns out that she actually had two other uh, husbands and uh, to other owners in Mississippi. And so that only comes out gradually when the pension examiner, having spoken to her, then starts talking to associates that she's mentioned and trying to verify her story, finds out about these other uh, relationships. Uh, part of what you're trying to do is to sort of figure out if you, when, when I understood people's motivations, I thought that I could then uh, tell which, what parts of their testimony were true and what were not. Rose Ballard is one of the people who uh, reveals her other, her other relationships. And then you have to think, well, but why is Rose Ballard telling this story? And uh, once I thought I understood Rose Ballard and her relationship to Mary and Helen, I thought I could trust what she had to say. And of course, there were uh, professional witnesses who were probably getting a, a piece of the pie. Right. And so there's a whole kind of machinery that's generating false testimony. Uh, it involves uh, lawyers who have uh, may have as many as a thousand clients. Uh, they uh, they uh, hire agents who work in particular localities. The agents hired old soldiers to find uh, people uh, actually to apply for pensions. They're trying to match up. They have a list of uh, the soldiers who served in a regiment, how many died, and they just try to find a wife for each one of them. And sometimes they find the right person, sometimes they don't. It's hard for us to imagine that these intimate relationships could exist, especially across plantations. And yet, on the other hand, it really sort of speaks to the need for these human connections, no matter how harsh the realities are. Uh, I think, you know, what's hard to, the hard part about this is how do people develop intimate relationships when they are property? How do you breach those property lines uh, in order to establish a real connection with people? And that's what the story of making neighborhoods is all about. It's about people crossing neighborhood lines, uh, crossing uh, plantation lines to marry, to court. And it really, there's something about the persistence of that that is profoundly moving. Uh, and it really speaks to people's desire for human connection. What surprised me about it, what I didn't know going in, was how much of that is bound up with a sense of place. Uh, the fact that people are are able to kind of create a neighborhood, gives them an arena, gives them a ground uh, for all these different relationships, which uh, slavery is designed to deny. And the slaves themselves, according to your book, refer to these places as neighborhoods. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I found this uh, testimony looking in these uh, pension files. The pension files are people testifying after slavery, often in, mostly in the 1870s and 1880s. I had to be very careful to make sure that the testimony that I had found was not simply an artifact of the period of emancipation. And at that point, I began to look at uh, old narratives that uh, former slaves had written before before the Civil War, people who escaped slavery, people like uh, Frederick Douglass, people some of whom we very, know very well, people like Nat Turner, uh, the famous rebel. And what really floored me was how much those people tell their stories in terms of neighborhood. And uh, we just didn't really quite understand how uh, much meaning this sense of place really had to people.
You say that slaves in the Natchez district mounted fewer revolts against slaveholders than they did elsewhere in America, not because they had any more love for their, their, uh, their, their masters, but because they, they understood the, the power dynamic. Explain what you mean by that. Well, we've known for a long time that slaves in the United States launch fewer rebellions in other parts of the Americas. So if you look at places like Haiti or Jamaica or Brazil, you find uh, a number of very large rebellions involving slaves in the hundreds, even the thousands. And so one of the things we've tried to understand about slavery in the United States is why do you not see as many rebellions on as large a scale? And uh, my, for a long time, people had thought that there's something about the intimacy that develops between slaves and owners, that slaves, in a sense, developed a kind of dependency on their owners and a kind of psychological dependence. What I find is that it really comes down much less to uh, psychology, but power and power on the ground. Uh, these neighborhoods are uh, a very difficult terrain for slave rebels to navigate. On the one hand, you have, uh, in order for rebellion to really amount to anything, it has to tie neighborhoods together. But that's a very difficult thing to do when people are used to striking alliances within neighborhoods. The other part of it is that slaveholders have their neighborhoods too, and they're bigger than slave neighborhoods. So what that means is that everyone who imagines uh, trying to launch a rebellion has to come to terms with the fact that they are surrounded by their owners, even if they outnumber them. And that's a very difficult terrain uh, to rebel. And of course, there's the reality that the slaveholder can sell someone who, who has a family, not just a, a neighborhood, but a, but a real family. Uh, the, the range of ways in which a slaveholder can uh, try to exercise control over their slaves is really boundless. And some of them are the obvious ones, like the physical violence of whipping or even rape. But it also involves uh, certain kinds of threats, of uh, threats of uh, not just violence, but threats of change. And so one of the things that slaves know is that their owners can sell them, and they can sell them for uh, the most minor transgressions or the most important ones. And so you don't have to sell a lot of people for everybody to know that that's a real possibility. And so if a slaveholder sells one slave, people know for decades that that person is gone, they know why they're gone, and they know that they could be gone. You mentioned earlier that, that slaveholders did recognize some unions as marriages, but the, the marriages weren't legal per se, which was part of the dilemma for those trying to collect a pension. Um, but were some of these unions, these marriages, from plantation to plantation, or were they, for the most part, in, in the plantation together? Uh, to a great extent, mostly certainly they are within the plantation, but there is a great deal of marriage across plantation lines, and that becomes very important uh, in uh, holding neighborhoods together because obviously marriages uh, kind of uh, beget other ties. Uh, they have children. That creates ties between uh, families. It creates ties between generations. And people, these cross-plantation marriages are really remarkable. Uh, I know of one uh, woman who was uh, married to a guy named Tom Baker, and Tom Baker actually uh, in gets uh, ends up in a uh, conspiracy to kill uh, his owner and kills his owner. Uh, and so the woman, uh, many years later, is applying for the pension of a man that, who she was with after him, after Tom Baker. And the first thing she says is, I want it understood that my husband was Tom Baker. And he was killed. He was killed for trying to, because he killed the overseer. He was hung. And so what you realize is that a certain way, that bond to her husband, uh, even though they didn't live on the same plantation, really outlasted their marriage. It outlasted his life. And it's much more important to her than that pension. These stories are just so fascinating and, and, and intimate. And I'm wondering what the black community's response is to this new, new, new look, really, that's so different from what we've been hearing for the last 30 years. Uh, you know, the book's only been out for, uh, for a few weeks, and, and we'll see. Uh, I really do feel like people are ready to hear about slavery. We've been, uh, you s notice more and more that there are uh, books about slavery. You see them in book reviews. People talk about it in a way that they didn't used to. Uh, and I think what people, uh, what this book offers people is a sense of what slavery looked like and felt like on the ground. And so I think that this will be uh, a book that 
uh, people can embrace as uh, telling them something, making them feel what their history was like. We have a, a significant anniversary coming up in 2008. Tell us about that and what kind of reaction you expect in the United States. Uh, in 1808 is the end of American participation in the transatlantic African slave trade. And uh, England is actually celebrating their 200th anniversary of, of the abolition of the African slave trade, which was in 1807. In England, it's a very big national event. You can find plays, you can find museum exhibits, uh, you can find uh, political leaders talking about it because it's a moment they can really embrace. It's actually the work of abolitionists and it leads to the abolition of slavery. In the United States, the end of the uh, transatlantic slave trade really becomes part of the expansion of slavery. And so it's a much more ambiguous moment in our history. I don't think that we're going to celebrate it very much, but I do hope we can talk about it and use this as an occasion for thinking more about slavery in our history. We just have a couple of seconds remaining, but you're also part of a UNESCO project, which is uh, known as Breaking the Silence. It encourages the teaching of slavery to young people in the Atlantic world. Why do you think that's so important? And, and what most importantly from this book do you hope people take home from it? Uh, it's a project that is going on all over the Atlantic world. It's something I do with colleagues of mine at Penn State. Uh, and it's important, I think, because we need to come to terms with this uh, part of our history to know uh, how much uh, kind of division and oppression there is in our history. We need to know that. But also to know how persistently people strived uh, under those kinds of exactions. It's something really deeply human about the way in which people were able to form a slave society even under those conditions. All right. Thanks so much for talking with us. Glad to be with you. My guest has been Tony Kay. He is the author of Joining Places, Slave Neighborhoods in the Old South. For Pennsylvania Inside Out, I'm Patty Satalia. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.